Hello, and welcome back to the story of Gaelic decline in the 16th century. In my previous two videos, I covered the sequence of events that led the narrative to this point, with notable things like the Revolt of Silk and Thomas and the Desmond Rebellions. If you haven't seen those two videos, then I'd highly recommend taking the time to watch them before you start this one. The events of the Nine Years' War would not have been possible without the groundwork that was laid by the preceding events that I've discussed in this series, so you may find yourself a little bit lost otherwise. I'll post links to the previous two videos in this series in the description below. Alright, let's begin. The scene as it stood in Gaelic Ireland after the Desmond Rebellions was a grim one if you weren't a Protestant settler. Queen Elizabeth had committed to a plantation project of unprecedented scale, which led to huge amounts of land in Leinster, Connacht, and Munster in particular, being assimilated into the Kingdom of Ireland. For the Lords of Ireland, men who had become used to their practical independence in past years, it felt like they were being squeezed into a tight corner, and having their privileges stripped from them. In addition to this, the war between England and Spain had begun to strongly reinforce Anglo-Protestant identity. This meant that to be a Catholic subject of Elizabeth was to be an untrustworthy one. As a result of this, the Anglo-Norman lords of Ireland found that they were being excluded from the old privileged positions that they had become accustomed to occupying. Positions in things like the army, the judiciary, and the parliament were now principally reserved for the so-called New English Protestants, who were viewed as much more trustworthy by the crown. These changes in the status quo caused a great deal of resentment in the Anglo-Norman families in Ireland, as they felt that they were being abandoned by their sovereign, despite having been mostly loyal down the long years. The old Anglo-Norman families had been among the first to arrive from England back in the original 12th century invasion of Ireland, and felt that they were owed more respect. For the Gaelic Irish lords, the increase of plantation and the squeezing of Gaelic territory was just more of the same, and they were by no means happy about it. The actions of Elizabeth had led to an aristocracy in Ireland that was ripe to explode into rebellion, given the right prompting. The central location in this story is Ulster, the last great bastion of mostly unmolested Gaelic Ireland. The English efforts to exert their influence in the province began in the early 1530s, with many officials and viceroys making visits in the attempt to gain support of the lords there. In the 16th century, the O'Neills were the preeminent power in Ulster, and controlled large amounts of land directly, while simultaneously receiving tribute from smaller landholders nearby. Much like other Gaelic clans, the head of the family was known by his title, the O'Neill. The English understood that in order to make any sort of progress in Ulster, the support of the O'Neills had to be secured. The first meaningful English success in this endeavour came in the early 1530s, when Con O'Neill, who was head of the family at the time, accepted an earldom from Henry VIII. The details of the surrender and regrant policy that made this possible are something I covered in my last video, but suffice it to say that Con was now a lord of the Kingdom of Ireland, and was subject to the English legal system. Con was created the Earl of Tyrone, and swore an oath of fealty to the crown. Con's acceptance of the title of Earl seems initially to be fairly innocuous. However, there are some unforeseen consequences to this decision. The inheritance laws of Gaelic chiefdoms and English earldoms operate on different systems. Chiefdoms use a system of succession called tanistry, whereby the successor to the current chief is chosen from his relatives. The selected heir is known as the tanist, and need not be directly related to the chief. His second cousin, for example, would be as valid a choice as his firstborn son. Earldoms, on the other hand, operate under the primogeniture system where the firstborn son of the current earl stands to inherit everything. This inheritance practice was common in both England and Europe, but it was much rarer in Ireland. Under primogeniture law, Con's son Shane would have been heir to Tyrone, as he was the firstborn son of the family. However, due to a somewhat comical clerical mistake, Shane would end up losing his right to inherit the earldom. You see, when Con travelled to England to accept his new title, he was accompanied by someone who sources disagree a great deal about. Some attest that this man was Con's adopted son, while others say that he was simply a bastard child. 
Regardless, the man's name was Far Dorka, or Matthew O'Neill in English. When Con arrived in England, Matthew was mistaken for Con's firstborn son, and was recorded as such by the English record keepers. As a result, Matthew accidentally became next in line to inherit the Earldom of Tyrone, even though it's entirely possible that Matthew had no blood relation to Con whatsoever. Regardless, his claim now superseded that of Shane, according to English law. Naturally, Shane was furious about having been disinherited by a man who he likely viewed as an imposter in his family. The new line in succession in Tyrone was recorded in 1542, but Shane took his time before deciding to act on his anger. He resolved to secure his birthright by any means necessary, and in 1558, Shane tasked one of his foster brothers with murdering Matthew for having the audacity to take what was not his. Matthew's assassination was successful, but awkwardly, the recently deceased heir had fathered two sons. Brian O'Neill, the first of Matthew's sons, was Earl for a very short time before he too was killed on Shane's orders. Turlock Leenock, one of Shane's lieutenants, killed Brian in a skirmish in 1562. This meant that the earldom fell at last to Hugh O'Neill, Matthew's second son, and a very famous man in Irish history. However, unlike his older brother Brian, he was not in a position to simply step up and take on his role as Earl. This was because he had been fostered to an English family known as the Hovendons, and was away in the Pale. Shane sensed his opportunity, and stepped into the breach, declaring himself the O'Neill. It's important to note the distinction here between the O'Neill and the title the Earl of Tyrone. Shane was laying claim to the old Gaelic title by right of blood, not the earldom which, legally speaking, he had no claim to. The earldom of Tyrone still technically belonged to Hugh, but he was in simply no position to stake his claim. By this point in English history, Queen Elizabeth I was sitting on the throne. Elizabeth knew that what Shane had done was an illegal usurpation. However, she was inclined to come to terms with him rather than begin a costly war as Shane was a powerful man at the head of an exceptionally powerful clan. So rather than forcefully remove him, Elizabeth made Shane an offer. If he would swear loyalty to her and to her deputy Sussex, she would cast aside the claim of Matthew O'Neill and his sons and recognise Shane as the Earl of Tyrone. This sounds like quite a good deal for Shane. He gets to keep the land that he illegally seized and gets a legitimate earldom from the Queen of England. There was just one problem, however. Shane absolutely refused to swear loyalty to Lord Deputy Sussex. The two men were about as far from being friends as it was possible to be. Shane's enmity towards Sussex was fairly earned, as the Lord Deputy had made attempts on Shane's life in the past. He had done this because he recognised that the O'Neills were the chief obstacle to the expansion of English influence in Ulster, one of the last places where Gaelic Irish influence was still ironclad. Whether or not Elizabeth could truly have cast aside the legally backed claim of Hugh O'Neill in favour of Shane without causing an uproar among the Irish nobility is up for debate. Regardless, Shane refused her offer, on the basis that he would not swear loyalty to Sussex under any circumstances. Elizabeth did not wait around for Shane to reconsider his, his response, and gave Sussex the go-ahead to attack the defiant O'Neill. The Earl of Sussex straight away led an English force into Ulster to bring Shane to heel. The expedition was a complete disaster. Sussex's string of misfortunes came to a head at the Battle of Red Sagmus in 1561, where the better part of his army was annihilated by Shane's troops, after Sussex pushed too far into his territory. Unable to deal with Shane militarily, Sussex returned to his former methods, and attempted to have Shane assassinated at a banquet using poisoned wine. When the plot was discovered, Shane sent a letter to Elizabeth complaining of the dishonourable and underhanded methods of her deputy. Following this, Elizabeth agreed to talk terms, and peace negotiations ensued. As Shane had consistently had the better of the conflict, he was granted nearly all of his demands. It may be that Elizabeth was worried that Shane would become a tool of the Spanish if she did not appease him in some way. Her worries were not unreasonable as the Spanish were beginning to take more and more of an interest in Ireland as a means to tie up valuable English troops in meaningless fighting. Elizabeth gave Shane verbal confirmation that he was the legitimate second Earl of Tyrone, and he returned home, 
expecting that a formal document confirming his instatement would follow soon after. However, whether due to deliberate action on Elizabeth's part or a pure accident, this document never arrived. With the threat of English encroachment dealt with for the moment, Shane turned his attention to threats that were closer to home. There were two clans that went by the name of the O'Donnells and the MacDonalds, who now represented the main threat to the supremacy of the O'Neills in Ulster. Shane resolved to declare war on these two clans, in order to force them to accept him as their overlord, securing the hegemony of the O'Neills. Shane was coming off a victory against the Queen of England, and no doubt his opinion of his own military acumen was at an all-time high. They didn't call him Shane the Proud for nothing. The opening stages of the war saw initial success for Shane, but eventually he overextended himself and suffered a heavy defeat against the O'Donnells at the Battle of Farset Moor in 1567. Shane's army was shattered after this engagement, and he was forced to throw himself upon the mercy of the Macdonalds, having nowhere else to go. Unfortunately for Shane, the Macdonalds were all out of mercy, and promptly executed him. Following the death of Shane, the title of O'Neill was passed around several times, including to Turlock Linnock, the murderer of Brian O'Neill. It would not be until 1585 that Hugh O'Neill would finally, with the support of Elizabeth, come into his inheritance. Hugh's upbringing with an English family in the Pale set him aside from his fellow Irish lords somewhat. He did not have a pristine reputation among them, and many viewed him as a creature of Elizabeth's. However, Hugh's English upbringing conferred some advantages as well. Due to his time spent in the Pale, and his several visits to London, Hugh understood more than your average Irish lord the intricacies of English politics, tactics, and army structure. He was better equipped to rebel against the English crown than any Irish lord before him, and it is likely that he understood this fact. Hugh was in every sense a modern man, but he was more than capable of playing the Gaelic Irish warlord when it suited him to do so. In some ways, he was the English hope for Ulster. No doubt Elizabeth hoped that his English upbringing and her support for him's claim to Tyrone would make him sympathetic to the English cause. However, the evidence would suggest that Hugh was not for England or for Ireland. Hugh was on Hugh's side. Hugh inherited his title at a time when Ireland was beginning to spiral into a destructive conflict. Aggression between England and Spain continued, and members of the Catholic Church were making rebellious noises in Ireland, hoping to attract support from the fervently Catholic Spain. Initially, Hugh was unwilling to commit one way or the other. If he remained steadfastly loyal to Elizabeth, there was a real chance that he could be removed due to his religion as the plantations spread into Ulster. If he chose to rebel, he risked everything and could end up with his head adorning the Tower of London. The first phase of what would later be known as the Nine Years' War erupted in 1593 when Maguire raided into Sligo and Roscommon. He also attacked the English garrison in Monaghan. At this stage in the conflict, O'Neill was still playing the loyal subject, and so went with Lord Bagenal to bring Maguire in. Together, they captured Enniskillen Castle from Maguire's troops. Hugh himself received a minor wound during the assault, and retired from campaigning for a brief recovery period. While he was healing, he sent a passive-aggressive letter to Elizabeth, complaining that his efforts to stabilise Ireland were being taken for granted. In addition to this, he used his contacts in London to place the idea in Elizabeth's head that without him, Ulster would be completely ungovernable. This seems to have had the desired effect, as Lord Bagenal, who had been sceptical of Hugh's loyalty, received a letter soon after ordering him to cooperate with the Earl of Tyrone. While all this was happening, the Archbishop of Armagh was in contact with Philip of Spain. Philip was apparently claiming that if the Irish chiefs rose up in full rebellion, help from Spain would be forthcoming. Hugh was aware of these developments, and in 1595 he threw his extremely well-equipped army, which included 4,000 musketeers, behind the rebels. Hugh and his associate lords inflicted defeat after defeat on Elizabeth and her poorly trained army. They took Enishkillen Castle, as well as the Blackwater Fort, and made inroads into Monaghan. There had been no word from Philip. Perhaps he felt he did not need to intervene since the war was going so badly for England. In late 1595, Elizabeth called for peace talks, and these dragged on into early 1596. 
it looked like an agreement was about to be reached. That was until Philip showed renewed interest, clearly wanting to prolong the conflict. In an attempt to fully secure Philip's support, Hugh offered the crown of the Kingdom of Ireland to Philip's nephew and went on the offensive again. The spring of 1598 saw the famous Battle of Yellow Ford, where the English were so badly defeated that news of the battle spread across Europe. After this battle, Dublin was left wide open, and Hugh could have sacked the Pale if he chose. However, it appears that he still hoped for a reconciliation post-war, so he held off on causing real damage to the English foothold in Ireland. Just as the English were beginning to recover from the serious defeat, King Philip of Spain decided to play his hand. A large fleet of Spanish ships set sail for Ireland, and the rebel forces rushed to Kinsale to link up with these potentially war-winning troops. When the Spanish expeditionary force arrived, it was roughly 4,500 strong, though other sources placed the number at something closer to 3,500. The English troops under Lord Mountjoy beat the rebels to the Spanish landing grounds and drew themselves up in order of battle. Faced with a potentially bloody engagement, the Spanish decided to barricade themselves within the walls of Kinsale, knowing that O'Neill and his allies were rushing down from the north to relieve them. Lord Mountjoy settled in outside Kinsale for a siege, aiming to have the Spaniards ousted from the town before the rebels could reach them. The besieging English force was quite a large one. Notes from Lord Mountjoy's secretary state that he had 11,880 foot soldiers under his command, as well as 857 cavalrymen. The rebel forces that eventually arrived to relieve the beleaguered Spanish were equally formidable. O'Neill and O'Donnell were said to have brought 4,000 foot each, while O'Donnell in particular fielded an impressive cavalry detachment of 3,000 men. Despite Lord Mountjoy's hopes, the Spanish clung stubbornly to the walls of Kinsale, and provided the time that was needed for the rebels to arrive in support of them. O'Neill favoured a light-handed approach to the coming conflict, whereby the English forces could be harried by small attacks and subjected to the rigours of winter. The younger and more energetic O'Donnell, on the other hand, wanted to bring on a full-scale battle as soon as possible. Perhaps O'Neill was convinced by O'Donnell's strategy, or maybe he simply didn't want to appear a coward. Either way, the two men agreed to bring on a pitched battle with the English at dawn, on Christmas Eve 1601. A plan was laid where the Spanish would be signalled by musket shot to sally out from their gates and attack the English from the rear, while the rebel forces pressed them from the front. The stage was now set for a historic victory that would see a large English army completely annihilated. Well, that was the plan, at least. In reality, the Battle of Kinsale was something of a mess for the rebel forces. First of all, the Spanish failed to appear from behind their walls when the signal was given, and this fact has never been entirely explained, though some theories attest that the Spanish were convinced the plan was an English ruse to lure them out into the open. Despite this setback, the failure of the Spanish to appear was not the end of the world. The rebels still possessed a large force that was at the very least the equal of its English counterpart. Unfortunately, the rebels were not able to use these forces effectively, as O'Neill and O'Donnell's men advanced into battle in a disorganised mess, jostling with one another rather than marching forward in a unified line. The final nail in the coffin came when O'Neill noticed that the Spanish had failed to appear at the appointed time. Having been against an all-out assault from the first, he decided to declare tactical retreat. O'Neill's troops began to move back towards their camp, but were interrupted by Lord Mountjoy's cavalry. Mountjoy had sensed a golden opportunity and seized it with both hands. The rebel forces ceased their organised withdrawal and began to flee in a chaotic mess. O'Neill's entire force was chased from the battlefield by the English cavalry in a tragic and embarrassing performance. O'Donnell's forces had not yet engaged, but seeing what was happening, he ordered a full withdrawal as well. O'Neill's troops suffered the brunt of the casualties in the battle, with O'Donnell and the Spanish escaping practically unharmed. With the rout of the rebel forces at the Battle of Kinsale, the Spanish now had no hope of being rescued from the trap that they were stuck in. They held out for a short time before finally surrendering on the 2nd of January 1603, and this event signalled the total strategic defeat of the rebels, though they did not all lay down arms immediately. Hugh O'Neill managed to escape the debacle with his life, 
and when terms were offered by the English, he took them. At the peace table, he was offered very generous terms by Elizabeth. Life, liberty, and his earldom in Tyrone. All things considered, Elizabeth would have been quite justified in executing him. Hugh had raised his banner in rebellion, scorned her at the original peace talks, and cost the English crown an absolutely ruinous amount of money. However, Elizabeth was anxious to restore peace to the island, and did not want to antagonise Hugh's many relatives. So ends the story of the Nine Years' War, and the O'Neill role in it. Some Irish earls continued to fight for a time, while others went to Europe seeking help from the monarchs there. However, most Irish earls simply fled the island, in the famous event known as the Flight of the Earls. This, more than anything, signalled the end of Gaelic independence, as so many earls simply abandoned their territory, leaving a power vacuum where loyal administrators could be neatly slotted into place. The loss of Ireland's aristocracy proved to be a devastating blow for the preservation of the Gaelic way of life. Without leaders, the Gaelic population were helpless to push back the now rapidly expanding plantation projects. And while this wasn't the end of the rebellion in Ireland, there's plenty more rebellions to come, it was the end of organised Gaelic resistance to the enforcement of English influence in Ireland. Thank you for listening to my telling of the Nine Years' War and the prominent role played by the O'Neills in it. Um, I'll need to have a little bit of a think about where to go next from here. I've got a few candidates for new videos, but I'd love to hear any ideas that you've got as well. Um, I enjoyed writing this one, and I hope that you enjoyed listening to it as well. As usual, you can contact me at keanrowanyt, YouTube at gmail.com, and you can find small posts that expand on topics from my videos at www.irishhistoricalstudies.blogspot.com. There's a few interesting posts up there already, such as some discussion on the fight between medieval and modern in early Renaissance Ireland. Thank you again for listening.